viewers. Well, tonight I'm treating myself to a horn of mudgy mead um, because we're here to talk about Vikings. Um, as uh, my colleague Steve Hand pointed out in a recent video, um, something like 15 years ago now, we published a paper in Sparta here um, outlining the basic idea that you can take the fundamental principles and techniques used in big centre grip shield combat in Talhofer and apply them to big centre grip shields as used by Vikings and other Dark Age people. Um, so that was basically my idea and I ran over to Steve's and said, hey, how's this for an idea? And he went out and found evidence that it was actually true. Um, and thus the papers. Since that time, uh, lots of people around the world, particularly in Europe, have actually taken this idea and run with it and worked out extra cool stuff, um, which is really gratifying to see. Uh, more excitedly, um, there are now Viking wargaming figures that have been sculpted based on our ideas. Uh, so, you know, making it big in HEMA, but when you get little Viking figures using your research, that, that's big time. So. Um, but this video is not so much about the use of the shield. I am going to, planning on doing a series of videos on how I've systematized uh, the big shield. Um, but this is about the other half of the weapon system, that is the sword. So let's have a look at a typical Dark Age Viking type sword. Um, I have over the years actually played with uh, several real ones of these. Um, this isn't, but this is as close as you're likely to get, okay? So this is a really high-end, museum-quality replica of a typical Dark Age sword by uh, Craig Sitch of Manning Imperial, right here in Australia. And as you can see, it really is a magnificent thing. Um, beautifully made. And that itself is important to note, okay? It, during, you know, from about the 13th century on, really, European metallurgy was good enough that they could stamp out munitions-grade swords at an almost industrial scale, okay? So they weren't ridiculously expensive bits of kit. Um, back in the Dark Ages, that was not true. Uh, this is something that was owned by an extremely wealthy individual, uh, okay? So this is, this is not just a sort of a Ferrari, this is you know, perhaps a better analogy is, this is your private Learjet, okay? It's, it's an extremely expensive object. Um, and that's important because it carries with it the implication that nothing about this is random. They didn't put an uncomfortable pommel on these things because they thought it lo looked pretty, okay? Every aspect of the design of this is there for a serious and effective practical reason. Um, so let's just have a look at it. So, the first thing that's obvious about it is that the hilt is very different to a medieval sword, okay? Uh, obviously, you don't have the long cross. You've got a very, very short, stubby cross there. But also, the pommel is quite different. The pommel extends out sideways quite a lot, and the handle is quite short. Um, the result of that is that it jams my hand into it in a, a very... S stiff hammer fist, okay? I can't extend my hand beyond there before this pommel digs into my wrist and stops me. Um, which, uh, you know, a lot of people find uncomfortable, okay? It's similar in many ways to the grip of a sword like the Indian Tulwa, and if you go back through our videos and look at one called Trip to Lens, you can see uh, me playing with some uh, antique talwars that do much the same thing. It really, this really does feel the same thing. It arrests my sword, my wrist when it gets to that point. Um, that has obviously significant effects on how you use the sword. We're going to look in a little bit about how it affects how you cut with it. Um, obviously it also affects how you can thrust with it. Okay, with a medieval sword if I just swap over for a sec, I can allow this grip to shift out to sort of what they call a handshake grip, like so. Okay, I can 
swing it around in nice cool moulinets without this nice round pommel getting in the way of my wrist and I can extend my thumb along it in order to bring it point down to deliver a thrust and as you can see the blade profile is designed for that it's designed for both cutting and thrusting the Viking sword if we look at the blade profile here is obviously not okay this is not optimized for the thrust this is a broad thin flat slicing blade. Uh, the blade itself would not be out of place on a sort of 16th century Highland broadsword to be honest, um, but it's obviously designed mostly for cutting, for slicing and not for thrusting. Um, the crossguard does not offer anything in the way of hand protection. Okay, why is that? Well, fairly obviously because it's meant to be used in conjunction with this. Okay, the sword and the shield go together and my hand should never really be in danger because it should never extend out beyond the rim of the great big shield that goes along with it. Um, and in fact, that being the case, I don't want a long cross, okay? I want to have as little furniture on here as possible so that it doesn't get in the way as I manipulate the sword close to the edge of the shield because that is what is keeping my hand safe. If I have a medieval sword with a great big cross, this actually gets in the way. Well, oh, you know, turn it. This thing is actually bad. It gets in the way. It interferes with the manipulation of the sword around the shield. I don't actually want a big cross there. I want as little hilt as possible. So why, might you ask, do I have a hilt at all? Um, the, for instance, uh, Celtic swords didn't have hilts. They were used in conjunction with big flat shields. Um, obviously, no hilt means that they had no pop problems manipulating the sword around the shield. Um, so why have this cross at all and why have this extended pommel sticking out there? Well, this also serves a purpose. Okay, I've got just enough of a cross and just enough of a hilt that if I slam my sword into a shield, I don't hurt my knuckles. Okay, so this allows me to bang my shield to make noise, but there are more practical things to do than this. I can use the hilt of my sword to manipulate my shield or an opponent's shield and keeping my hand quite safe. Um, you'll also notice that I've taken my gloves off for that um, because even with uh, my glove on that was enough to uh, so that my hand was contacting the shield. So these things were used without any gauntlets at all. These were used just with uh, a bare hand or perhaps a thin glove. So how does this specifically designed and rather restrictive grip affect how you actually cut with the sword? What sort of cuts can you make and how much damage can you do with them? Um, well, I'm going to start by doing a bit of a test cutting on a fairly heavy grade tatami mat over there. Um, and I'm going to deliver two cuts, one like uh, in the restrictive dark age grip um, and second using a more typical medieval looser grip where I can extend that sword further and accelerate that point a little bit harder and see what difference it makes to the damage that I can do. Um, now I'm not going to be using this for the test cutting even though this is sharp. Um, reasons are twofold. One, this is not mine, okay? Um, and if something happened to it I couldn't afford to replace it so I'm going to leave the test cutting with this for the person who actually owns it. Um, Secondly, I don't want the slight differences in sharpness and weight and blade profile to affect the result. Okay, I only want to vary the grip. So I'm going to be using the medieval sword for both cuts. Um, the first one, I'm going to restrict my grip to a dark age hammer fist and then I'm going to do it as a more kind of normal blow. So first time through, let's try the dark age cut. So I'll bring you closer here so you can see the damage that that just did. So here we have some nice deep slices through the target there, through the target there. Um, each of those cuts is quite deep, about halfway through the tatami. It's certainly lethal against an unarmoured person. The other thing I would note about those cuts is I felt very little resistance as I delivered them. 
Okay, the sword just swept through without any real impact back to me at all. So I'm now going to do the same, do another cut, but this time I'm going to throw the cut in a more medieval, renaissance fashion, allowing the sword to slip through into long point with a handshake grip, which I can't do with the Dark Age sword, and see what difference that has on the effect of the cut. Well, that's an obvious difference. So as you can see here, this delivered a much deeper and much more powerful cut, okay? There is absolutely no comparison. The deep slices of the drawing cut were fine, but the medieval cut definitely delivered more power. You'll also note that this very tight dark age grip really restricts my range, okay? With this grip, I can't really extend my sword from beyond about here Whereas with the medieval grip, I can send my sword all the way up to here and hit my opponent at a much further range. Now, it could be argued that if I'm fighting with a big Viking shield, I don't really need that range. I can't hit my opponent until I get past the great big shield. And so being able to extend out for here doesn't really help me very much. In order to strike, I've really got to get in past this shield here at which stage extending my sword fully out isn't really helpful. I actually want this tight grip so that I can throw my cuts at this range in a most effective manner. That said, there are still targets and techniques that use this grip that would be kind of useful to be able to do. For example, with this grip I can't throw a high horizontal blow over onto the temple like that or, for that matter, a vertical blow over the shield onto the head like so. The tight dark age grip doesn't let me get up there or across there because it arrests my wrist there. Um, even if I channel a Bolognese person for a moment, even just stepping out to the side and sticking a straight staccato into the head like that, I cannot do that with the Dark Age grip. It, I can do kind of prison yard thrusts up into the belly like so, but I can't, and I can do descending thrusts over the rim of the shield, but I can't do a straight thrust over into the head like that. Um, one of the other things about not being able to extend my wrist out is it makes it a lot harder to hit the leg. So we all know that in any sword and shield combat, this leg is a really big target. And with my medieval sword, I can strike my opponent's leg from way out here. However, in the Dark Age grip, I can't reach it. Shuffle forward a bit. Still can't quite reach it. I've got to be really very close in order to reach that leg. And so why, while it is still absolutely a viable target, it's probably not nearly as big an issue with Viking shields than you might actually think. Now there are some things that this grip does allow me to do. Um, in particular, unlike say a tulwar, it does allow me to stick the thumb underneath the flat of the sword, which gives me access to some cuts that are going to be useful. So, for example, I can throw the false edge of my sword horizontally over the rim of the shield in time my opponent's head like that. Not going to be as strong as a true edge cut, but still useful. Likewise, I can flip this vertically over the shield onto my opponent's head, which again is not as useful as a good solid true edge down right blow, but I can attack those angles by using this very sort of Germanic grip and these very Germanic cuts. All that said, I'm still losing out on a lot of useful stuff by being restricted by this grip. So why? That is the question. This sword is designed to keep me from extending. Um, so whatever the reason be, it must be something that is so fundamental about sword and shield combat that the sword is specifically designed to force you to do it correctly. So what might that be? So here is a possibility. If I throw my sword out in a medieval fashion, and we're particularly thinking about battlefield shield wall type, uh, situations here which is you know what the weapons are really designed to do 
Um, one of the most likely things that's going to happen is that my sword is going to be parried by the edge of my opponent's shield. Now with a sharp sword, that is either going to cut straight into the shield and get stuck, and we know from the sagas that this is a distinct possibility. Against Gunnar came Vandal, and smote at once at him with his sword, and the blow fell on his shield. Gunnar gave the shield a twist as the sword pierced it, and broke off short at the hilt. Sigmund drew his sword and cart at Skarp Hedden, and the sword cuts into his shield so that it stuck fast. Skarp Hedden gave the shield such a quick twist that Sigmund let go of his sword. Or it might even snap and break, okay? In either case, not good for me. If, however, I'm restricted by the sword itself to this much closer grip, it means that in the same situation, my sword is only going to slide across the edge of the field and it's much less likely to get stuck in the edge. This itself has other interesting consequences. Uh, so we all know that Vikings were very fond of their little hand axes and friends who are into tomahawk and boarding axe type things uh, tell me that getting your axe stuck in the target is again a major issue with any sort of axe fighting. Using the same stiff wrist and sweeping cuts, this becomes much less of an issue and pretty well automatically means the axe does the hooking thing, which the axe of course is designed to do. Now that also has some interesting consequences. So every time I swing a sword to the inside line of my opponent's shield, they can of course parry with the shield in one of two ways. They can use the edge, or they can turn it all the way around that center uh, pivot point and use the flat. Now, the edge is obviously quicker, okay? And we know that that is correct, for example, Italian Rotella, okay? Because we see it in the manuals. And against the sword, that will absolutely work. However, against an axe used in this manner, it doesn't. The inside edge parry simply gives the axe man access to that hook, which is exactly what they're looking for. On the other hand, if my opponent comes, flips the, sword, the shield fully over into a full inside guard, I can't hook his shield, even though I've got behind it here, I still can't hook it, I don't have the mechanical ability, and I'm now dead. So, we're, you know, we're skipping a little bit ahead into shield technique, but there is a good reason why the full inside guard using the flat of the shield is actually better and probably the default parry to the inside line as opposed to just pulling the edge over a bit. The edge will work against a sword, will not work against an axe. A final curiosity about the Viking sword is there are numerous references in the saga to people grabbing the sword with two hands and delivering more powerful blows. Hor Wendell, in his too great ardour, became keener to attack his enemy than to defend his own body, and heedless of a shield, he grasped his sword with both hands, and his boldness did not fail, for by his rain of blows he destroyed Collar's shield and deprived him of it, and at last hewed off his foot and drove him lifeless to the ground. Um, so, how the hell am I going to do that? Uh, well, I'm not going to try and hold it like a longsword, that's obviously silly. Uh, grab it there. I don't think so. I value my fingers too much. Half sorting definitely doesn't fit the descriptions in the sagas. Um, now, most people, if you ask them, would say, well, you just grab it like that and you've got two hands on your sword, which is fine, but it does not deliver any more power at all. It just feels weird and awkward. So, if you want to do a two handed grip with this weapon, the way we do it is like this. I place this hand on top of my sword hand like so, so that my left hand is now supporting and pushing that blade as I cut, okay? So I have this extra line of structure and support with which to help drive this sword into the target. So I'm not swinging it any faster, but I am pushing more energy into it after impact. So I'm going to do that and see what difference that makes to the delivery of the blow. So, 
a dark age blow with two hands. Well, that made an enormous difference, didn't it? Mm. Lovely stuff, that. So, um, just a couple of things to finish off. Um, first of all, with this very restrictive Viking grip, um, one of the things that it reminds me of just instinctively is uh, something like Myers Dusak, which, uh, again, broad blade, it's, the Dusak is quite short, um, and so you don't really want to use any wrist, you want to keep it in the same grip. Um, and to me, the Viking sword feels very, very much like a Dusak. Um, so if you're looking for a model for the sword techniques, um, I would say something like Myers Dusak would be a really, really good place to start because the weapons really do feel quite similar. Um, obviously, things like saxes are quite a Dusak like, but even the Viking sword forcing you into that same grip really does want to swing through very much like a Dusak. The other thing uh, I just wanted to mention is how this is a really stark example of how difficult it can be to do historical European martial arts in a historically accurate manner. So, you know, in this case, you'd have to be really quite restrictive about what weapons you allow people to use. You've got to make sure they are not able to extend their hands out and hit other people on the leg at ranges that you can't do with a Dark Age sword. Um, and you have, you know, all and you have to introduce, say, penalties for striking the edge of your opponent's shield really hard with the edge of your sword, because in real life that would be a bad thing. Um, there are safety issues, so, you know, if you just use an accurate sized cross and pommel and jam that hand in really tight, um, what do you wear to protect your hand? Uh, it's going to come out from behind the shield and get tagged occasionally, um, but do you make your hilts longer and your crosses longer and your pommels bigger in order to allow the wearing of, say, a padded glove? And if you do that, how does that affect the restriction of the grip? Is that going to allow people to do things you can't do with a real sword? So there are all sorts of issues um, that you've got to face if you actually want to do this in a historically accurate manner. Um, now, in this case, those are really clear that they exist. Um, honestly, I, I don't have any particular answers on this kind of thing. Um, I just wanted to point out that these issues do exist. And honestly, things like longsword and rapier, if you want to do them sort of in a competitive context, have exactly the same issues, even if they're not as obvious to the casual observer. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the Viking sword.